Right to go? Thanks very much for joining us. Well, we're here today to launch the Defence Strategic Review, uh, which we'll be releasing a unclassified version of uh, here today. And I'm joined, of course, by uh, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Defence, the Minister for Defence Industry and Minister for International Development in the Pacific, our Chief of the Defence Force and the Secretary of the Department of Defence. National Secretary is the most solemn responsibility of any Australian government. We confront the most challenging strategic circumstances since the Second World War, both in our region and indeed around the world. That's why we're investing in our capabilities and we're investing in our relationships to build a more secure Australia and a more stable and prosperous region. The scale and significance of the Defence Strategic Review and my government's response shows the strength of our determination to keep Australians safe. And I want to take the opportunity to thank Sir Angus Houston and Stephen Smith for their extraordinary work. This represents a document for today and tomorrow. It is the most significant uh, work that's been done since the Second World War, looking in a comprehensive way at what is needed. It demonstrates that in a world where challenges to our national security are always evolving, we cannot fall back on old assumptions. We must build and strengthen our security by seeking to shape the future rather than waiting for the future to shape us. That's just as true for defence capability as it is for energy security, cyber security and indeed our economic security. And that's why the work we're undertaking as a result of this review fits together with everything that our government is doing to repair our supply chains upgrade our energy grid, boost our cyber security systems and rebuild faith in our public institutions. The recommendations of this review will underpin our work bolstering relationships with our international partners and promoting peace, stability and prosperity in our region and our world. At its core, all of this is making Australia more self-reliant, more prepared and more secure in the years ahead. I congratulate, I thanked already Sir Angus Houston and Stephen Smith, but I also want to thank the CDF, the Department of Defence and our national security team. Uh, we have met for many, many hours at dozens of meetings over the National Security Committee over a long period of time, both to examine the interim reports that we receive, but also uh, to make sure that in the lead up to the budget that will of course be handed down in a little over two weeks, uh, we've got this right. I'm confident that we have got this right and I think this work is uh, work uh, that gives great credit to all those who've been involved with it. Tomorrow, of course, we will commemorate through Anzac Day all those men and women who serve in uniform to defend our nation to defend our sovereignty and our freedom. We thank those who've done that in the past, but we also honour those men and women who serve us today. And we also, through this review, are planning for tomorrow and the future. Well, thank you, Prime Minister. And let me also start by thanking uh, Sir Angus Houston uh, and Stephen Smith for producing a hugely significant report in the defence history of our nation. Today's defence statement observes that we are facing the most challenging set of strategic circumstances that we have for decades, and we do so at a time where Australia's economic connection with the world has never been greater. We are enormously proud of the Australian Defence Force, which is a fantastic defence force. And the defence posture that we have had for the last few decades has served our nation well. But in the circumstances that we now face, 
that defensive posture is no longer fit for purpose. And so today, for the first time in 35 years, we are recasting the mission of the Australian Defence Force, which will have five elements to it. Firstly, to defend our nation and our immediate region. Secondly, to deter through denial any adversary that seeks to project power against Australia or our interests through our northern approaches. Thirdly, to protect Australia's economic connection to the region and the world. Fourthly, with our partners, to provide for the collective security of the Indo-Pacific. And fifthly, with our partners, to provide for the maintenance of the global rules-based order. Now, most of those objectives as part of the new mission of the Australian Defence Force are well beyond our shores. And so we need to have a defence force which has the capacity to engage in impactful projection through the full spectrum of proportionate response. Now, the Defence Strategic Review contains many recommendations which give expression to that change of posture. But in response to the DSR, today the government is announcing that we will be focusing on six initial priorities. The first of those is Australia developing a nuclear-powered submarine capability, and we made significant announcements about that uh, last month. The second is to provide for a much longer-range strike capability for our Defence Force, including through the manufacturing of munitions in Australia. The third is to better enable the Australian Defence Force to operate out of our northern bases. Uh, the fourth is to provide for a much quicker transition of new innovative technologies into service, and that's particularly with respect to operationalising Pillar 2 of the AUKUS arrangement. Uh, the fifth is investing in the uh, recruitment and the retention of our Defence Force personnel. And the sixth is to improve uh, our defence cooperation with our neighbours in the region, particularly in the Pacific. Now, there's been a lot of speculation over the last few days in relation to Army, and I want to say something about that. This review and the government's response to it does provide for a reshaping of the Australian Army, but in a way which gives it a much greater strike capability uh, and a much longer range strike capability but also a much greater ability to operate in a literal environment. Ultimately, what the DSR recommends and what the government is going to put in place will give rise to an army with a much more focused mission, with a much more enhanced capability. There are a lot of decisions that we have taken to reprioritise programs to put a focus on the six priorities that I have just described. And there are difficult decisions associated with these, and Minister Conroy uh, will speak to some of them. But I do want to uh, highlight that the review uh, makes a recommendation, uh, which the government accepts, of establishing a short, sharp review into Australia's surface fleet. Um, and that is a review that we will undertake um, and it will report in the third quarter of this year. But I want to emphasise that in the context of that review, uh, the DSR makes clear that it is essential Australia maintains a continuous naval shipbuilding capability. Um, we accept that recommendation and we are utterly committed to building ships uh, in both Adelaide and Perth. The cost of the DSR over the forward estimates will be around $19 billion. Much of that is already provided for in the budget. But as a consequence of the DSR and the government's response to it, we're reprioritising $7.8 billion worth of programs to enable us to put a focus on the six priorities that I have described. Uh, and we can do that over the course of the forward estimates within the current resources which are provided for defence. Beyond that, however, defence spending will need to grow. A recommendation of the DSR is that we do need to see a growing defence budget, 
and it is absolutely our expectation that defence spending over the medium term, over the decade, will grow above the existing trajectory of growth that we inherited from the former government. The DSR uh, provides for a recommendations around uh, the future articulation of national uh, defence and strategic policy. It does so by recommending uh, to go, go dispense with intermittent uh, defence white papers. We agree with this recommendation. Um, and the DSR recommends a structure of having a biennial national defence strategy. So today we are announcing that the first national defence strategy will occur next year. And that will be a document which will contain a more granular articulation of a range of the programs that we will be pursuing going forward. All of this is a watershed moment for defence policy in our country's history. And what it will provide for is an Australian defence force befitting of a much more confident and self-reliant nation. Uh, thanks, Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister. Today, in the release of the Defence Strategic Review and the Government's response, is a vote of confidence in the Australian defence industry. It's a vote of confidence in saying that we need a sovereign defence industrial base in this country if we are truly to be independent and sovereign and have supply chain resilience. And two great examples of that within the DSR is the commitment to uh, manufacture guided weapons and explosive ordnance within Australia uh, as soon as possible. Secondly is the commitment to continuous shipbuilding in this country. Around 100,000 Australians rely on the defence industry for their employment. They're a critical part of our national defence effort and we expect strong future orders for them, particularly in advanced manufacturing around building ships, building nuclear propelled submarines and building some of the most advanced missiles in the world today. Importantly, this re uh, review also recommends and the government has accepted significant reforms to defence procurement to increase the speed of our acquisitions. With the disappearance of the 10-year warning horizon for a major regional conflict, defence acquisition must speed up. We must also embrace more risk uh, in that process with good policies to surround that risk, but we need to give the ADF the equipment they need as soon as possible. Importantly, this builds on important defence procurement reforms that the Deputy Prime Minister and I announced in October last year to make sure that the money we spend in defence is spent wisely and effectively. We inherited 28 projects running 97 years late cumulatively and we need to do much better and we are working hard on that right now. The review also goes to innovation and the need to strengthen and sharpen defence innovation and that is something this government is embracing wholeheartedly. Uh, towards the end of this year, we'll be releasing a defence industrial development strategy that articulates how we'll grow that sovereign industrial base to support the ADF, not just today, but into the future. Importantly, as the Deputy Prime Minister said, this review and the government's response involves taking hard decisions. The last government cut $12 billion from defence since 2016 and added $42 billion of additional spending commitments without a single other project being changed. We are being honest and transparent with the Australian people and saying that we do need to reprioritise, and that includes changing uh, some projects. Uh, most notably, uh, in our attempts to modernise the army and reshape it, make it effective working in a littoral environment, we are reducing the number of infantry fighting vehicles we're acquiring under Land 400 from 450 to 129. That will equip a mechanised battalion as part of a combined arms brigade. But importantly, the money and resources uh, are freed up from that endeavour and a cancellation of a second regiment of self-propelled houses will fund the acceleration and expansion of uh, high mobility artillery rocket system, HIMARS rocket systems that have been used so effectively in the Ukraine conflict, and to expand and accelerate the acquisition of land-based maritime strike to give the Australian Army uh, significant range and projection. We'll also be accelerating and expanding the acquisition of uh, landing craft, both medium and heavy, to transport army assets where we need to get them to be. So at the end of this process, we'll go from an Australian army, where the maximum range of its weapons is 40 kilometres, 
to being able to fire missiles initially over a range of 300 kilometres and with the acquisition of the precision strike missile ranges in excess of 500 kilometres. This is about giving the Australian Army the firepower and mobility it needs uh, into the future to face whatever it needs to face. Prime Minister, can you confirm that out of this uh, surface fleet review we'll end up seeing less frigates acquired by Australia as we move towards submarines? And have you had uh, any communication from a foreign government, including Germany, about downsizing the Land 400 project? No, we, we have a review so that you have it, so that you do the analysis and then you make an announcement on the basis of it. So we won't uh, preempt uh, that review. We've been very upfront about where decisions have been made, about the howitzers and about the Land 400 program, and we will uh, have that review. Uh, it is reporting in the third quarter uh, of this year, and then, of course, uh, we will uh, make public what the results of that review are. My, my question is for, for uh, Mr Mullins, um, just on the review, um, what assurances can you give um, local industry, especially companies who are waiting for the Defence Strategic Review, but within that has been announced in other reviews, now they've got to wait again? I know you said it's a you know, short, sharp review, but what assurances can you give them? Well, it is a short, sharp review, and it will report in the third quarter so that's the, of this year. So that's the first point to make. The second point to make is that uh, the DSR makes really clear the need for Australia to maintain a continuous shipbuilding capability in this country. That means both uh, at the Osborne Naval Shipyard in Adelaide, but also Henderson in Perth. Uh, and we have accepted that recommendation and we are completely committed as a government uh, to Australia having a continuous shipbuilding capability. We do feel, uh, as the review has recommended, that there is merit in having a short condition check at this moment in time about the future shape of our surface fleet. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, the first is that the surface fleet as it's currently constructed was determined at a time when Australia was still pursuing a diesel electric powered submarine. Uh, now that we are going to be operating a nuclear powered submarine, that is a dramatically different capability. And it obviously has some uh, implication in terms of the overall structure of the Navy, not only as we think about the next decade, but as we think about the next three decades. And the second is that the uh, Defence Strategic Review has observed that um, navies uh, around the world uh, are moving in the direction, to put it kind of crudely, of having a larger number of smaller vessels. Now, with those two ideas in mind, we are thinking about the, the long-term structure uh, of our surface fleet, um, but we are completely committed to having a domestic build right now. Um, the current work in terms of the uh, construction of Hunter will continue, um, and this review will report in the third quarter, uh, and it will do so in a way which does not see any disruption. No, no, no. Stop the yelling out. It doesn't work. If you yell out, you don't get the call. Ben, then Andrew. At DPM um, is, uh, and PM, there's clear warnings in here that, that um, more money for defence will be needed, but the, um, it sounds like the, um, the government is going for a cost-neutral uh, uh, position over the forwards. Um, uh, are you just kicking the can down the road here? And um, what sort of level of defence spending uh, as a proportion of GDP do you think that we're going to need? Well, I, I'm happy to, happy to start. What we've done here through the Defence Strategic Review is look at what assets do we need and where do we need them. So we make no apologies for that just not being all pluses. In some cases, what it means when you have a reassessment of what's required, uh, it would be a pretty, frankly, flawed review uh, that just added things on. And that's been the problem with the former government's approach. They haven't had that comprehensive plan going forward. Now, we make no apologies for having a comprehensive plan going forward, which includes, of course, uh, in including the previous announcements about AUKUS, $19 billion over the forwards for the DSR, of which uh, $7.8 billion will be uh, with reprioritisation. 
But we also, as a government, have made very clear that over a period of time we see that there will be a need for defence expenditure to increase above that which had previously been budgeted for. We make no apologies for that. But what we don't do, what you shouldn't do with any project, uh, with any, uh, any uh, expenditure, is just have a target and then try and spend to meet your target. What we're about is what are the defence assets we need and we will do whatever is necessary to make sure that that's provided for our country. Uh, we're looking at reprioritising $7.8 billion over the forward estimates. So that's acting right now. Um, and there is a huge degree of urgency in terms of the action right now. Um, it's to state the obvious that when you um, stop a particular program, you liberate money immediately. And that's why we believe that we can pursue these six priorities over the forward estimates through a process of reprioritisation right now. It's also to state the obvious that when you're looking at new programs, um, it takes a while in terms of planning to get to a point where you, to be frank, spend the money associated with those programs. And you can see that if you look at the profile of spending associated with the uh, nuclear powered submarine program, for example. So when you do the profiling of what we need to do in relation to defence, um, we are able to meet the, the priorities that we have put in the statement that we've made today through a process of reprioritisation over the forward estimates and beyond that, as the Prime Minister, Prime Minister has said, uh, we, we expect defence spending to grow. Andrew, what's next? Prime, Bill, the Prime Minister, the declassified version of this report does not discuss the possible invasion of Taiwan. In a scenario like that in our Indo-Pacific region, what of the recommendations here changes any possible Australian response to that eventuality if it were to occur? Well, we, our position is clear, which is we support the status quo. And uh, that's not changed uh, by this. Uh, we call for a peaceful resolution through dialogue. Uh, that's not changed. By this, um, I forget who said Phil and then Katina. Yeah, the report's quite critical um, of the increasing use of the defence forces for domestic um, disaster response, yeah. bushfires, floods, and even COVID. And it says it's leaving it. Um, you know, it's, it's, it hasn't got the resources to do its day job and, and do that as well. And it says state and local governments and the Commonwealth have got to put in the plans, resources, and capabilities to do the separate defence. Is that a realistic suggestion? Do we have the the capacity, financial and personnel-wise, to have some sort of Well, it's a serious suggestion uh, arising out of the review. And we know that uh, one of the, uh, the national security issues we're dealing with is climate change, uh, because climate change is resulting in, as the science predicted, uh, more frequent and more intense natural disasters. And the role of the Australian Defence Force is primarily not to deal with our natural disasters and de those domestic issues. And that's something that's reflected in the review. Uh, as a result of this review and the transparency in which we've conducted it, obviously there will need to be uh, further consideration of how we deal uh, with these natural disasters, uh, which I think that uh, Australia in my time uh, as Prime Minister, and I haven't been able to stand here for a year yet. Uh, I don't think there's been two months when I haven't been visiting Tasmania, northern New South Wales, the Riverina, uh, the Riverland in South Australia, up in the Kimberley, uh, northern Queensland. Uh, there have been multiple events. Now, we need to, as a, a government as, and as a nation, uh, work out an appropriate response. And the review is really uh, indicating very clearly uh, that that context can't be just saying, oh, well, we'll rely upon uh, the Defence Force. The Defence Force are always, always very willing to participate, it must be said. And uh, they have done an extraordinary job and uh, will continue to do so. Uh, but. Uh, the review indicates that there's a need to consider 
uh, the broader issues in that context. Katina? The, the review says, um, as I understand it, that there isn't enough work currently for the Henderson precinct, but it also calls on the government to step in and make sure the dry dock project happens. How do you reconcile those two things? And could you also talk about the challenge um, in workforce, both uniformed and in defence industry? Is that something that's going to be able to be filled by migration? Well, I might deal with the, the last question first and then uh, throw to Pat to speak about Henderson. Um, in terms of workforce, uh, it is one of the real challenges um, that, that, that we face, both in terms of our uniformed workforce um, and also those in the department, but also those within defence industry. Uh, and um, it, we've articulated this in the context of uh, uh, building a capacity to build nuclear-powered submarines in this country, that having uh, the requisite number of skilled people to do that is perhaps the biggest challenge we have in, in relation to that. Um, and that's why one of the six priorities that we are focusing on coming out of the DSR is around both the growth and the retention uh, of our Defence Force personnel. Um, you, you made the comment in, respect, in your question in respect of immigration, but one of the unique uh, features of this sector, both in terms of those who wear our nation's uniform, who serve in the department, but also those who work in defence industry, um, is that we really need citizens to be doing that work from the point of view of our security requirements. And so that adds to the challenge. And we completely understand um, the training that is going to be required here. And that's you know, why we announced um, uh, an academy when we uh, announced the uh, submarines uh, last month. Um, it's why we're working on the task force with the South Australian government around having the uh, required number of people. It's why we made an announcement about having 180,000 fee-free uh, places within our TAFE system. All of this is about making sure that we are training the people that we need to to do the very significant job at hand. Okay, well, well Hi, uh, on the Deputy Prime Minister's last point, as part of the AUKUS announcement, we allocated $3 billion over the forward estimates and $30 billion over the life of the program on industrial uplift, including training Australians. We will actually train Australians to work in our shipyards. Uh, on the question around the Henderson Dockyard, this points to uh, the mismanagement and bungling of the last government around the offshore patrol vessel, where they ordered the contract to Lursons. They then instructed Lursons to negotiate with another shipbuilder who lost the contract to try and include them in the supply chain. That led to very significant delays in the IPV. At the Henderson precinct, we have one shipbuilder who has a contract but not a lot of workers, and we've got another shipbuilder who's got a lot of workers but not a contract. And so the DSR quite rightly says uh, the federal government has to lead a conversation about how we consolidate at Henderson so that we have our continuous shipbuilding. We're at Osborne in Adelaide. You have large vessels, frigates and destroyers built on a continuous basis to maintain the workforce and the national capacity and minor war vessels, patrol boats and other smaller vessels built in Henderson with a continuous workforce that is a national asset. And that's what we'll deliver through an updated naval shipbuilding plan that will also canvass the dry dock issue later this year. Okay, we're going to go here, then Karen, then here, then Anna. Prime Just to save you all some arm fatigue. <laughs> Um, we've heard a lot about we don't have a 10-year lead time. Given that we have cyber attacks, more grey zone um, warfare possibilities and economic coercion, uh, are we looking at a lead time that is, it can be measured in days or weeks? And Mr Miles, given that there's a greater focus on operating from northern Australia, what, what's the future of the Port of Darwin? Well, um, well, the Port of Darwin has its own process, which has been... Um, actually managed through the Department of the PM&C. Um, and so I'll leave the response to that process um, when it is ultimately concluded. Um, I mean, we do live in a world, you rightly observe, where um, there is much greater grey zone activity. Um, the DSR talks about the need for us to have capability across the five domains, one of which is now cyber. Uh, so we don't think now in terms of just... Um, land, uh, air and sea, but we now think about cyber and space as well. Uh, and there are important uh, steps that we are taking about making sure that we have 
the most robust cyber capability possible. And again, you, you, you rightly observed, as we have seen, uh, we can see uh, that cyber attacks happen within our economy with, with no notice. And, and the boundary between state actors and um, and crime has become very grey indeed. And so uh, it's a critical capability um, and it's one that we see as very important in terms of our future um, defence capabilities. Yeah. Um, the review on, on acquisitions, the review uh, talks about defence being too focused on being perfect and not prepared to take more risk and that it should take more risk. Um, from the outside, it doesn't look perfect now the processes don't look perfect, the outcomes don't look perfect. So what is going to change in practical terms to shorten those time frames, because the word urgent comes up a lot, and improve the outcomes without ending up leaning too far towards risk? Well, I might um, give a, a start to that question and then uh, ask Mr Conroy to, to add. Um, I think it really is important um, that as we engage in the acquisition process, we have time um, as a critical factor in terms of how quickly we can get a capability um, into operation. Uh, and that is a factor which is um, just as important as the extent of the capability. In other words, uh, what the DSR is observing is that in the past the pursuit of the perfect has often been done at the expense of time. There is uh, an opportunity cost and a capability cost associated with that, so we need to rebalance that. It's also important, I think, that we change our relationship with risk. Um, we, in order to get capabilities online quicker, uh, we do need to be uh, taking more or accepting more risk in, in the process of uh, engaging in procurement. Now, we're really aware of the legacy, in a sense, that we have from um, those who have been operating in this space um, in the years past. And defence ministers have stood up here and talked about the fact that we need a more nimble and quicker um, procurement process, and in a sense we're doing the same today. Um, the one point I'd simply make is this, that in order to meet the moment, uh, in order to meet the circumstances and the sense of urgency which is described in the DSR and by the government's statement today, we simply have to uh, speed up our capability process. I'll just, I'll just uh, uh, Sorry, uh, three quick points. One, as the Deputy Prime Minister alluded to, you will look at a shift in paradigm towards what's called minimum viable capability. So instead of trying for the perfect, instead of refusing to accept into service a capability until it's at 100% of what is contracted, we will engage in an iterative process where a platform might be at 80% of what is contracted, and that 80% is still a lot better than what they're currently using. We will accept it into service and improve it steadily through um, upgrades as you'd expect. So the ADF gets their equipment quicker, they can use it where they need to, and we uh, involve the upgrade process to deliver on what's been promised. That's a, a very different approach, but it reflects the change in our strategic circumstances and lessons, where a lot of projects have gone into trouble trying for that final 10 per cent of capability. The second point I make is we have to be a lot smarter about acquisition strategy. We're running competitions now where it's very clear who is going to win that contract. We're running artificial competitions that waste industry time waste industry dollars and defence dollars, we can ensure um, value for money for the Commonwealth through smart contracting methods, but being much more aggressive around sole source, where it's a like-for-like -like replacement or it's strategically complex. So it's about smarter contracting strategy. And thirdly, it's about better procurement management. Uh, the DPMI announced six significant reforms uh, to procurement in October last year, really targeted at some of those really uh, high-profile complex projects, particularly around projects of concern, bringing everyone together to solve problems quickly rather than ignoring them. To give you an example, the last government had six ministerial projects of concern summits in nine years. Six in nine years. I've had two in nine months to get projects back on track to provide ministerial energy. So those three reforms are, are critical to addressing issues you canvassed. Prime Minister, you mentioned uh, the need for greater self-reliance and you also said not that we can't just rely on old assumptions. What is your assessment of, in the decades ahead, the US's reliability as an ally and whether there's any risk of isolationism growing in the decades ahead? The US remains 
an important ally. It's a relationship between nations, it's sort a of relationship between peoples, and it's based upon our common values. Probably best direct to the Defence Minister, but are we talking tens of thousands of additional people in uniform that you need to convince to join the Defence Forces? And given the impacts of Iraq and Afghanistan and the Veterans Suicide Royal Commission, how can you assure people that the culture is right for people to choose that as their career? Well, I actually think there is an excellent culture um, within Defence, and uh, to be honest, one of the privileges that uh, we've all had in being able to work closely with the Defence Force is to experience what I think is the best expression of team that I have come across. Um, and, and I think it is about telling that story to the Australian people uh, and, to, and to young people in particular about the opportunities available uh, for them in being a part of that team and, and in serving our nation by wearing our nation's uniform and the skills that are acquired through uh, having the experience of, of working in our Defence Force. It, it, it really is a great career. But we are going to need to encourage thousands of more people to uh, take up this opportunity over you know, a, a, a significant period of time. I mean, the current glide path uh, that the former government articulated was over the next two decades. But it is right that we have a challenge right now in terms of maintaining um, the, the levels in the Defence Force that we've got right now, because uh, since the former government announced the 2020 Defence Strategic Update, uh, we've actually seen uh, the Defence Force go backwards, uh, and, and that's not acceptable. So I think it is about uh, making it clear that there is a great opportunity in serving in our nation's uniform. Uh, we have measures which we will be articulating in the lead up to the budget about how we make that more attractive to, to people who want to serve. Uh, but I think fundamentally it, it is about actually explaining how uh, extraordinary it is to have the privilege of working in uh, Australia's team. So Charles, Paul, three, four, five. Thanks, Pam. Uh, there's a real focus in this on Northern Australia and enhancing both our offensive and defensive capabilities up there. Is Northern Australia currently vulnerable and is that our weak point of national defence at the moment? What I, I think it's fair to say that one of the themes of the review is, uh, I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't characterise it the way that, that you do, uh, but that we need to strengthen our Northern bases. And common sense tells you that, that that's the case. Uh, so that's a theme. Uh, it's something that uh, the government's very conscious of and in our response to the review, uh, that will be something that is undoubtedly a focus. We, we talk, as I said in, in my opening, about the need to have a defence force which has the capacity to project and to have impactful projection. And it's really in that context that uh, we see, and the review observes, uh, that our northern bases are a huge asset and a huge opportunity. That's, that's the place from which we can project. Um, and so it's really seeing it through that light and making sure that we are investing properly in those bases so that we can have a defence force which is more able to operate from them. Paul, just to follow up to Phil's question, is a federal civilian natural disaster agency still on the table as an option to ensure the ADF is a true last resort? Or is it better cooperation with the states that's the preference? We've got a pretty big announcement today. Uh, I think this will do for today, frankly. Uh, we're dealing with it pretty comprehensively. And uh, this is what we're dealing with today. So it's not a new, it's not a new well, idea, this, so that, you might have a preference. You get one question, Paul. Well, it's the same question. <laughs> you get one que You might <laughs> like the answer, Paul, but come to tomorrow there'll be an Anzac Day event. Wednesday there'll be another event. If you come to National Cabinet on Friday, you'll see other events as well. What we're doing today is the Defence Strategic Review. Um, just on, probably best directed to, uh, to Minister Conroy, given he's in charge of the Land 400 tender. What is now the time frame for making a decision on that? And, and it looks like the criticism around procurement and things like Australian industry content requirements, um, the need to buy more stuff off the shelf, it looks like it's a pretty good day if you're an American arms company, not so good if you're a, an Australian contractor. I will, on your latter point, Andrew, I reject that char characterisation. Australia industry produced plenty of off-the-shelf products 
that are already in service in the ADF that are doing great service. What we've been saying is that we need to be very clear about our acquisition strategy for projects. Some will be developmental, some will be off the shelf, and we need to be very clear about that because a lot of projects that have been characterised as off the shelf in the past were developmental, and that's why they got into trouble. On Land 400, uh, I've consulted and briefed the, the governments of the two countries involved, uh, the Republic of Korea and Germany, and spoken to leaders from the two companies who were the shortlisted tenders. The, the process from now on is that uh, uh, Defence will touch base with them and will come back with revised pricing for 129 infantry fighting vehicles, and then the government will make a decision going forward. But importantly, um, an infantry fighting vehicle capability is an important part of a modern Australian army. Uh, but we also need the capacity to deploy them, and that's why we're investing in landing craft, medium and heavy, and investing in a generational change in long-range strike for the Australian Army as well. Uh, another question for Minister Conroy. Um, just on the Advanced Strategic Capabilities Accelerator, the um, review notes that uh, it should be an unencumbered entity outside of defence. Uh, what's the government's position on this, and can we also confirm that that's a renaming of the uh, advanced uh, Strategic Research Agency? Uh, it, it is a renaming of, of that other body. Uh, we're really focused on getting this organisation up and running as quickly as possible, and that's driven the structure that we've chosen for it. But ASCA will be uh, critical in driving defence innovation, in providing opportunities for Australian-based companies to provide technical solutions to challenges that the ADF is seeing in the field right now or over the next decade. But you can expect further announcements on that. Uh, Prime Minister, uh, over, the first year, over the first year of your government, you've announced a lot of new measures to boost manufacturing across a wide range of areas, so uh, from energy to industry, now defence, and eventually we're going to need to start building subs as well. Are you concerned that that might be too much of an ambitious blueprint to boost Australian manufacturing? Do we think we have the workers to fill all those vacancies? Not at all. I think that uh, one of the themes of uh, my campaign for election as Prime Minister in the lead-up to 2022. I had five themes that I ran over and over again at the National Press Club and in most press conferences. One of them was a future made in Australia. And one of the lessons of the pandemic, as well as the international context in which we're talking about today with strategic competition, is we need to be more resilient. We need to have uh, greater control over our national sovereignty. So not only is manufacturing things in Australia good for jobs and good for our economy, it is also a national security issue. We're vulnerable if we're just at the end of global supply chains. And we can see that across so many areas, whether it be in defence and to go to the point that, that Andrew's question raised, I think not only are uh, Australian uh, defence manufacturers capable of building things for us, uh, what we've seen is that their international reputation is outstanding and they have an opportunity not just to make things for us but to export as well. So whether it's energy, whether it's pharmaceuticals, whether it's uh, uh, advanced manufacturing capabilities through our National Reconstruction Fund is there in this context, uh, we have a plan for our economy. It's a plan that's about growth and about jobs, a plan uh, that's about using uh, the cheaper and cleaner energy to drive advanced manufacturing in this country so that we're more resilient going forward. And part of that, part of what we're dealing with here in terms of this review as well, is that uh, there'll be a lot of analysis about expenditure and, and, uh, and uh, some uh, reprioritisations. If you're making more things here, you're actually then contributing through revenue measures, through people paying taxes who are employed, through businesses paying taxes. You're generating economic activity as well here as well. Uh, so that's then able to help assist with the reinvestment that will be required for what we're talking about, which is for the increased expenditure that will be required over a period of time. So I'm really confident uh, not just that we'll be able to do it, but we'll be able to do it well. Uh, this is, I think, a fantastic document, and that's a good opportunity perhaps to uh, end today on. Thanks very much.